um udmi hello everyone i welcome you all to the first panel of this conference on empowering periods and shaping menstrual policies for schools i riya pawar along with my co-host udmi nandi are here to host the panel for you the conference has been diligently curated by project vedna and team sarkari school in collaboration with girl up band in the midst of recent conversation in india surrounding menstrual leaves we would like to share with you our broader vision and point of view for empowering young menstruators and advancing period equity reducing dropout rates as a result of periods through this panel we intend to promote a fruitful debate exchange differing viewpoints and join the strive towards enacting inclusive laws that empower and assist menstruating students in their academic endeavors together we can cultivate a culture that views periods not as a hindrance but as a normal part of life that should be embraced and enjoyed the overarching theme of this panel is implementing comprehensive menstrual health policies on a larger scale to provide students with necessary information and support and a conducive environment in schools to manage the menstrual cycles comfortably while up- upholding the dignity and providing adequate resources schools serve as a foundational environment where girls should feel liberated protected and equipped with the necessary infrastructure the panel discussion is titled laying foundation creating menstrual policies for schools that aims to examine the menstrual health programs in india and their social implications and pave way for the future formulation for future policy formulation yes um over to you urmi thank you it is a privilege beyond words to welcome you all in this event and now to give you a formal welcome address i would welcome and i would request my team member aryan to kindly come forward and welcome the guests thank you urmi um, first of all i would like to begin with a quote menstruation is just a small price you pay for being blessed with the grandest gift you can ever wish for and that is the privilege to give birth good morning one and all present here i would like to welcome you all to this session on laying the foundation creating menstrual policies for schools i bid a very warm welcome to our mentors our esteemed speakers for today and my fellow teammates and the viewers i welcome you to this session on laying the foundation creating menstrual policies for schools this panel seeks to explore the ways in which menstruation can be normalized and policies related to the same can be created for schools to ensure awareness at a very early stage to en- to enrich our panel today and to embark on this journey with a vision to eliminate taboos surrounding menstruation and to empower the menstruators in schools we have with us honorable guest one Dr- drishti patni who is the co-founder and president of girl up couch and our honorable guest two drishti makhijani founder of project khadira director at khadira hygiene period poverty activist and guest number 3 kushboo sharma who is the project lead women health patient academy for innovation and research and our honorable guest for niharika sharma co-founder and director at painted red and last but not the least our honorable guest number 5 radhika murthy facilitator and researcher on mhh gender and sexuality we are sure that this session will greatly advance the aim of creating menstrual policies for schools we are looking forward to learning from you all today i hope this discussion engages inspires and induces our viewers to act towards spreading the importance of menstrual awareness among youth thank you over to the hosts thank you aryan for introducing the guest sarkari school is a platform of young motivated and passionate individuals who aspire change Before we proceed next I would now invite Soumya to tell us more about the organization. Thank you so much Hermi. Firstly good morning everyone. I would like to start by extending a very warm greeting to one and all present here. A Tibetan author once said that a child without its education is like a bird without its wings. Our organization Sarkari School also works on the same ideology. 
Sarkari School is an initiative of Free Citizens Foundation. Since 2019, this platform has been known for recognizing and celebrating the unsung heroes who tirelessly contribute to the upliftment of government schools and education. These individuals deserve not only our appreciation but also our support and recognition to inspire others. They demonstrate that with self-determination and hard work, anything is possible, even without a substantial backing. Our primary objective is to change the negative perception surrounding government schools and create a supportive ecosystem where society can uplift. Am I audible? Yes, you create are. a supportive ecosystem where society can act as true friends as these institutions. We strive to engage the youth and encourage their involvement in developing the favorable ecosystem for government schools. In the last four years, we were able to engage with more than 3,000 plus youth across India and also had the privilege to work with more than 500 plus schools across India. At Sarkari School, we aspire to become At Sarkari School, we aspire to become a think tank by addressing and resolving issues in a constructive manner to become what happened. We generate innovative ideas and implement them to bring about revolutionary change. As we know that government schools are often stereotyped and subject to negative judgment, it often overshadows the achievements of government schools. Sarkari School seeks to change this narrative by providing factual information by the stories of success and hope relating to government schools. Thank you. I would like you all to join us in every possible way. Thank you, Soumya, for giving us insights into broader vision, aims, and work of the organization. Now, I would invite Nandini to tell us more about the session and the panel. Thank you, Irmi. Empowerment is a multidimensional social process that helps people gain control over their own lives. Today, discuss regarding women's social, educational, economic, and psychological empowerment is in the limelight. However, these discursive debates subjugate menstrual health and policies. Menstrual issues remain untouched in the paradigm of taboos and stereotypes. Policies and education around menstruation become even more important on this spectrum. But the barricades of shame created around menstruation talks have weakened our ability to think and act. Menstrual health and hygiene is challenged by period poverty, repercussion on education, dignity in professional settings, social insensitivity, and the silence that transcends it all. It is in this spirit of promoting debate, deliberation, and discussion regarding policy challenges that relegate the cruciality issues surrounding periods. We have organized a virtual national conference on empowering periods, shaping menstrual policies for schools. The overarching theme for the conference is keeping school as focal points to educate, support, and empower folks regarding menstruation and menstrual policies. So we hope for this come join us in our endeavor to brainstorm, learn, and grow. Over to the host. Thank you so much, Nandini, for telling us more about the aims and visions of the conference. So now that we have developed a good understanding of the overarching themes and aims of the panel, let us hear from our speakers one by one about their dynamic perspective regarding this issue. Um, now I would like to request my colleague Nandini to invite and introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Drishti Patni the co-founder and president of Girl Up Coverage. Drishti Patni is currently pursuing her undergraduate degree from University of Delhi. She's also actively involved in building up a startup. As the co-founder and president of Girl Up Coverage, Drishti has successfully built a community of over 50 students across India, dedicated to eradicating gender stereotypes. Through her menstrual hygiene awareness, Vertical, the organization has made a significant impact, reaching out to more than 500 women in Delhi NCR region. Prior to her involvement with Girl Up Coverage, Drishti was associated with Pink She Foundation, India's largest women's NGO focused on ending period poverty. In 2020, she made her history as the youngest secretary of Junior Chamber International 
leading projects related to menstrual hygiene awareness. Thank you, thank you so much, Urmi. I hope I'm uh, perfectly audible and visible to you guys. Um, a huge thank you to the um, organizing committee and the organizations to have me here on board. I'm really excited. Uh, my name is Drishti, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty glad that Urmi gave a wonderful introduction of me. I don't have to waste my energy there. Um, coming to the topic uh, that is creating sustainable menstrual hygiene policies for school, um, uh, when I was growing up, I, I'll try to narrate it to, to you guys like a story. Uh, I, I grew up in one of the best private schools that there is in Guwahati, right? And uh, I remember in class six, uh, there was a private assembly of all the females in the middle school and we were supposed to stay there. And the teachers divided us in groups and they started hushing. And I, I was a mindless child. I did not pay much attention to them, but they were actually hushing about how we need to dispose of the period um, uh, absorbance or the pads properly in the school so that it does not create a havoc for anyone. And I was like, okay, why was this conversation not had around boys? Because in six, I had no idea about what periods was or what menstrual hygiene is or men what menstruation is in itself because nobody ever had that conversation with me. My, my friends were all shush, shush about it because they were told to never have a conversation about it. And let me tell you, this is like a private school. This is like a full-blown private school, Karan Johar type of a school where everything is so open. People, people talk about dating, people talk about their sex lives, but period was a shush, shush topic. And if, if that's the case in a private school uh, back in like 2013 or 14, you can guess what the situation in government schools can be. And, and that's a sad reality that um, whenever we are dealing with women issues, and I, I'll say women issues, and because people people tend to deal with them with a kid's glove or people just tend to brush them under the rug, which is very wrong. Um, if you think about it, women make up half of the in, half of the country's population. We as a sex, uh, female as a sex, is predominantly present, but our problems are always dealt as if they're secondary, and that is wrong. And of course, the foundation of everything starts with schools. We need to be groomed from a very young age um, uh, to talk about these issues, to come up with innovative solutions, and to support our peers to come up and talk about these issues, right? Um, uh, again, speaking from experience, um, when I was a secretary at Junior Swimmer International, we took up this project called Project Unnati, um, where we were we took up a school under our wing. Uh, we adopted a school and we were doing infrastructural development for them. Um, we, we built up the entire school, we made sheds, we made uh, we, uh, we installed water filters, we renovated the washrooms, we painted the classrooms, we did everything on our own. This was a bunch of five, six students who were like 17 or 18 at that time. And um, I remember the principal coming up, the principal of that government school coming up to me and saying that, ma'am, um, uh, yes, but uh, you have to pani nahi aata at the time, so you have periods ke de de. because we, we installed like two big sanitary nap banks, sanitary napkin banks in the school. They just said that, ma'am, you have to use pani but you have to pani nahi aata. So, to koi use to karega nahi. So, this is just a waste of your money then. And, and that was so shocking because if you think about it, um, talk, when we when we look at menstrual hygiene, uh, Accessibility or affordability of the absorbents or pads is just one issue, but availability of water, availability of clean washrooms, availability of the uh, infrastructure to dispose of the uh, absorbents is other things. So this is like a multi-dimensional or multi-fold issue that we are looking at. And this is a reality of Indian schools and many, many Indian schools that due to the lack of funds, basic resources are not available to these young girls and this is something that i really hope that this panel will take up forward we'll discuss this and we'll come up with collaborative solutions and see where we can synergize in order to eradicate such teeny tiny issues that ex still exist in the education system um thank you so much um that was my time i'll hand, hand it back to Ulmi. Yes, thank you so much, Drishti, ma'am, uh, for presenting your views. It was rather very insightful the way you comparatively uh, presented in front of us um, a very, I would say, a very complicated topic in a very simple way. And it was like very engaging to hear from you. Um, and of course, the thing that you talked about, that we need to take a holistic view. We need all round development, not just giving patch, but also providing infrastructural facilities like clean washrooms and water in schools. Okay. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Um, now, Urmi, could you please call our next guest?
I will now call upon Drishti Makijani Ma'am, the founder of Project Kadira, director at Kadira Hygiene Period Poverty Activist. Drishti is a multifaceted student entrepreneur currently pursuing her bachelor's degree in computer science. She's making waves in the world of menstrual hygiene with her innovative D2C brand, Kadira Hygiene. Driven by her passion of social impact, she leads Project Kadira, an international initiative spanning India, Canada, and Ghana, dedicated to ending period poverty and fostering an inclusive period positive environment. Having impacted over 8,000 lives in the last six months, this remarkable project has earned her national and international acclaim. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I hope I'm audible and um, I have a stable internet connection. Yes, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, Drishti just right before me covered a very um, important pointer about M like availability of pads just being one chunk of the entire MHM uh, situation and that we have to sort of also work towards that ecosystem because in a lot of cases uh, when we move further into the rural areas um, availability of undergarments, soap, uh, clean water, all of these um, are chunks that need to be addressed together and it's like a multi-facet and a multi-fold issue but um, I would like to uh, steer the discussion into a slightly different direction um, you know when we're talking about creating policies for schools we can create um, you know policies um, at the policy level but when it comes to the actual implementation what we've seen is that there is lack of uh, sensitivity towards the issue in the entire e school ecosystem starting from the principals to the teachers and then trickling down to the students so no matter um what kind of policies we create at the national level if there is work not done on awareness and mindset change these issues will continue to persist right uh we will still see dropout rates even if we you know install uh pad banks or even if we um say, make products uh, as affordable as possible. It's not always economical reasons that, uh, you know, there is not, uh, people don't opt for usage of uh, proper menstrual hygiene products. It's also the social and the cultural reasons. Again, talking about the school environment, when we look at the school environment, again, um, the thing is that the major shame and the stigma comes from teachers itself, right? Uh, when back in school when i used to get my period again uh, coming from a from an extremely privileged background coming from a like i got the opportunity to study at a private school even then when i got my period and i had to go to the washroom there was a lot of hesitation because of the kind of shame that you would be subjected from your teachers uh, right right off the bat um so I think that's what needs to be tackled before we st start to talk about installing pad banks or we start to talk about, you know, getting these uh, policies into place. There is a lot of national conversation and I'm glad that there is conversation that has started the Supreme Court policy coming into play where uh, now government schools and residential campuses will have to uh, take responsibility for the menstrual uh, needs of the menstruators uh, enrolled in their um, schools and, uh, you know, in their uh, universities and places like that. But, uh, you know, when you talk about making these products accessible, it's also a lot about where are these products being made accessible? Are they available in the washrooms or are they at, at one secluded place? Or are they at the infirmary? Because when they're available at one secluded place or say at the infirmary, there is a lot of um, psychological effect that happens on menstruators when they go out and reach out for those pads. Because when you get your period, your first line of thought is you have to go to the washroom. And if the pad is not available at the washroom, if you go to some some second place, let's say infirmary, infirmary or a medical room is, you, is a place where you go where you're not well, where you're sick. Whereas menstruation is a normal bodily process, right? Why are pads not being made available as easily as soap or water or say, tissue paper in the washrooms, right? That's where the conversation is. And that's where the shame and stigma will end when the, these products are 
when i say accessible as accessible as this when there is conversation when there is openness from the teachers we know the kind of um i mean slut shaming or the kind of shaming uh, you know especially female students are subjected to you know starting from the length of the skirt to the stain that they see on the skirt if somebody gets their period or the length of the hair or if they're braided or they're not braided right so i think before um getting into policies obviously the more holistic level there has to be a lot of work done um in form of awareness and mindset change starting from the top management when i say awareness all of us quickly jump to you know uh, talking about menstruation to menstruators themselves but we for, we often forget that uh, while we need to educate and uh, you know make the menstruators of, like the students the students aware about it even teachers need to be um, sort of educated and empowered and mindset change has to work for there also so um i think that is it for my time um and i hope we're able to um sort of again as drishti said right before me um uh, have a meaningful conversation so that we can um, work collectively on all of these issues thank you so much thank you so much drishti ma'am for presenting your views and presenting the importance of implementation and along with implementation we need to look at implementation from a lens of awareness as well that is something that is very crucial and even i remember in my schools the way we used to carry the pad from our classroom to washroom we used to hide it in the best way possible so yeah that that was very enlightening so now i would like to request urmi to please introduce our next speaker Now I would like to call upon our next speaker Niharika Sharma the co-founder and director of Paint It Red Niharika is a development and management professional her NGO is dedicated to eradicating period poverty in India Niharika works with communities and firms on solutions regarding mental and menstrual health gender and sexuality and diversity equity and inclusion over the course of a career she is applied herself to philanthropist project geared towards the concerns of minority communities across india the uk and togo africa niharika has curated and implemented modules pertaining to mhm and mental health managed diverse country level gender and health programs collaborated with state governments and also had her work published in journals and online forums very good morning everyone thank you for having me here today at this momentous mental health conference um and i thank all the speakers before me for bringing in their uh, personal insights and for talking about uh, personal experiences um pivoting a little bit um as we gathered here today we cannot ignore the remarkable progress that has been made in the recent years um india's commitment to menstrual health has been exemplified by ground breaking initiatives in the social sector and also policies that are transforming the lives of millions right um we have seen positive changes in the form of policies that aim to provide you know subsidized um sanitary pads to adolescent uh, girls specifically uh, and such initiatives what they do primarily is that they acknowledge even if that might not actually happen even if the implementation becomes skewed right um what they do is that um they acknowledge the crucial role of accessibility and affordability in ensuring um menstrual health which as you all know has like a you know tremendous impact on health education and livelihood outcomes so as a scheme it was the swachh bharat abhiyan um which at a national level you know was a cleanliness campaign but which ended up bringing out menstrual uh, health into like the public discourse and emphasized the importance of safe uh, sanitation facilities at the end of the day if you look at it from a menstrual health perspective though obviously the larger goals of the scheme differed greatly um like you know addressing open defecation or whatever else 
um such efforts were meant to improve menstrual uh, hygiene and foster a sense of dignity and empowerment among menstruators obviously it is usually framed as women and girls but to um make it a blanket term here and more inclusive let's just refer like moving forward to people who bleed as menstruators um however such policies and programs while they exist um we kind of tend to as a you know structure or mechanism go wrong with regard to our implementation so the follow up question is constantly why which also within our democracy i feel like as a people we ask very less um the challenges that persist are uh, persist greatly and are exacerbated in rural and marginalized you know resource poor communities so we must continue to address the gaps within um those spaces so that no one is really left behind uh, and this includes addressing the need for sustainable menstrual products um you know tackling prevalent myths and taboos uh that perpetuate the stigma and hold people back um and you know especially affect the lives of rural women specifically um what really shifted my perspective within my practice like very early on um was that i had um you know i was building a tool for uh, evaluating what held back the entrepreneurial potential of rural women in rajasthan and what blew me away as like a 19 year old many many years ago um was that um menstrual health came up very regularly as a factor and that was not something that we were talking about back then um as much as we are talking about right now and for it to be such a massive livelihood factor for it to be such an outcome was um truly baffling which is kind of what uh, also ended up like propelling me into doing the work that i do today so um coming back to like how we need to you know um recognize the crucial role of education um by imparting the knowledge and breaking you know the silence around menstrual health we empower young people to embrace it as a natural process combat age old stigmas and take better care of themselves that's it um and that is kind of the goal that we want to be setting at the end of the day i'm sorry if there's like some noise i am in a very small village in himachal pradesh right now um and um, it was also obviously very surprising with like the national education policy that came about in 2020 that spoke so much about um holistic education but did not uh, address menstrual health as an imperative like integral piece of the puzzle at all um if you're talking about anything that is holistic how is it not important to teach students about their bodies um so that uh kind of becomes our job um and the job of policy makers to point that out to be like hey this is not good enough it's great that you've revamped our education policy but then it does not include something that is crucial and directly affects education outcomes so our job doesn't really end with observation we must ensure effective implementation and the monitoring of such policies um so collaborating with government agencies ngos and grassroots organizations to ensure that our envisioned changes reach every nook and cranny of our nation no matter how vast it is that is the point of these policies that is the point of implementation altogether um so we need to work towards a future where menstrual health is not just a policy issue but an integral part of our collective consciousness which is also something that uh, drishti highlighted right um that it needs to be something that you know we're just talking about that it needs to be normalized um so it's important to advocate for policies that amplify the voices of menstruators prioritize their well-being and foster an inclusive society where nobody is left behind and by nobody i mean that we categorically even at a policy level leave behind um trans intersex and other gender diverse menstruators right so the invitation to everybody listening today is to you know kind of find a way to join hands in this transformative journey and seize any opportunity to shape the future with regard to menstrual health even if it's not like menstrual health policy right um so that everyone can lead like a life of dignity at the end of the day 
um i think lastly i just hope that today's discussions kind of inspire um some sort of meaningful action that paves the way for a brighter more inclusive future i think i think that's my time yeah thank you yes thank you so much niharika ma'am for presenting your dynamic perspective first of all um, the point that you brought up of not only women menstruate but um, there are other genders as well that menstruate so thank you so much for bringing that point up in the discussion and also highlighting the policy angle in such a nice way that all the viewers could very well understand and giving us deeper policy insights into menstrual uh, menstrual domain Yes. So, Urvi, could you please invite our next speaker? I would like to invite Radhika Modi, a facilitator and researcher on MHH, gender and sexuality. Radhika is working on intersections of gender, sexuality, menstrual health, and SRHR. She is a part of UN Thirty for two thousand thirty for Asia Pacific. her deep interest in understanding the role of gender dynamics in our society inspired her to co-found the Jamia Queer Collective the only queer friendly space in the country's top university she also works with several international organization as a consultant including the oscar winning organization the pat project the stage is all yours ma'am hi um, i hope i'm audible uh Thank you so much for this lovely opportunity. Uh, it's a good way to spend your early morning Sunday, I would say. And uh, it was lovely listening to all the other speakers. And uh, yeah, I think for me it's difficult to go last because I think all the good points are already covered. But uh, I think I can speak a bit about my ground experience of working in different parts of the country and also abroad. But a couple of things uh, I think that stood out for me from. The, from listening to the other speeches was one is like visibility that i think niharika talked about and that something is really important to me uh, the way we talk about menstruation i think that terminology is very very important to me again uh, as someone who's queer and who works with queer people uh, i have seen this othering of uh, queer people which is really really sad uh, as queer people we don't have to constantly tell that we also menstruate especially trans people and intersex and non binary people and people who are still figuring out so i think for me the language is really important i would say uh, i think just working from the ground i think i remember i was in bhopal and uh, it was a government school it was a uh, uh, yeah it was it was a government school in a very very remote village and uh, there was this conversation around uh, disposal and i was asking them ki aap kahan iska niptara karte hain and uh, everyone was quiet and uh, it, there was a long silence and it's it's a girls school and uh, when i went to the washroom to use it uh, after my session i saw that the pipes you know uh, washrooms have those big uh, pipes uh, like some of them are broken pipes and it's all clogged with used pads and that's where they do niptara because niptara is such a difficult thing to do in open right so uh, i think all of you mentioned the holistic approach that we need to take i think uh, like niharika mentioned i truly agree that the government is trying the government has tried uh, be it uh, the yojana that she mentioned or rksk yojana uh, the government is trying but at the same time we need to see uh, how are they being implemented uh, be it through based on or the online studies that the government is again trying to do uh often times i have seen the products are not that high quality uh and at the same time uh it'll be interesting to see that most people don't want to use pads uh when we go to the low community like especially i went to a uh, very very remote village in mp uh people are not comfortable using pads so this idea of all size fits one uh it's something that really needs to change because uh, uh with my work in uh, uh like african country especially in kenya uh, a lot of people are using washable pads and that's something that's really successful that model is really successful so uh we need like when you talk about sustainability we need to also see uh, what other options are there i'm not saying that everyone should use menstrual cups or everyone should use pads or everyone just should use washable pads or non washable pads but the idea is uh having this idea of informed choice do we have that informed choice even when we make policy we need to start seeing it from not just one person's perspective uh there are a lot of people uh, who are offered menstrual cups and it's just not that they are scared of using menstrual cups but also it may not fit everyone's body uh, for example i uh, someone who's working in the menstrual health space for a long time and i'm not use, able to use a menstrual cup 
because of my bodily uh, whatever like differences right every vagina is different every cervix is different and uh, for some deep so for some people cloth that works like magic and also as, as a country uh, as an lmic our country really feels i think really focuses on the idea of this uh, you know pads can solve the issue it's like telling people that you know uh, we need to control the population of the country and let's give free contraception just giving free products is not the solution again like niharika mentioned it, it's great for visibility it is great it is it is the first step i would say one needs to take but beyond that what are we doing uh, something that came out uh, very recently to me i, I was i was visiting a partner kalash kyathi foundation in rajasthan and they are doing this uh, wonderful thing called matka incinerator because there is so much taboo associated with disposal they are doing this matka which is easily available in especially in the you know rajasthan and the gujarat parts of the country and uh, it's really interesting that women are collecting the sanitary pads or the cloth and they are burning it in, in the matka and i found it really uh, interesting because uh, again it's it's not the best thing for the environment but for them it works because they don't have to uh, dig it in the soil they don't have to hide and go somewhere and throw it and so for them it works so i think we also need to look at community driven solutions uh, which we are not doing at this point uh, and uh, for me uh, it's very simple like uh, my my idea of working in the menstrual health space also comes from my personal uh, struggles in my childhood uh, as a menstruator because i remember like this is a funny incident and i'll end after this i was in school and i started menstruating very early a lot of people think that people start menstruating at uh, 10 11 uh, or even 14 but uh, you know people have started people start menstruating at 9 a lot of us do and i started menstruating pretty early and for me it was like oh my god uh, what's happening uh, to my body and i couldn't understand it and no one in my class used to menstruate at that point i feel so and uh, i was going to the washroom and the pad fell off uh, from my bag and instead of picking it up i created this whole scene in my class where i was like uh who oh, who oh, what is this uh, you know foreign object on the floor oh my god what is this so that i don't i am not associated with the piece of pad and i was like oh my god let's do something about it let's throw it outside the window and i threw it outside the window thinking that oh i did such a great thing by saving myself from the disgrace of being called out as a menstruator or someone who's menstruating so the shame starts very very early and i i was very ashamed for a very very long time of of having menstruation you know of, of, of menstruating so uh, it comes from a personal space of not feeling accepted in my own body but uh, just looking at uh, from a position where i can make a change i hope this conversation makes a change like neha convention uh, i hope you know uh, this conversation go beyond this panel they make a difference it can be a policy it can be you going home and having a chat with your daughter sister whatever anyone who menstruates i would rather say and uh, lastly is just that when we talk about menstrual health management it's just not a bodily thing it's a mental and physical thing also there are a lot of uh, issues that are not covered for example pmdd which is uh, something i suffer and struggle with like um, like how painted red like it, they they work on the intersections of mental health also right they are trying to talk about the the mental health aspects of menstrual health even bala or uninhibited in the in, in our country let's not forget that menstrual health can have mental health implications also a lot of us go through painful very very painful pms so just having a period leave is not good enough i would say it's a good step but again a holistic approach is only going to come if if we get everyone on the table uh there's a very uh there's a very innovative conversation that's going on around the world it is men in menstruation right i would say community in menstruation like get everyone on the community get everyone on the table to talk about it if you are making policies for non binary people queer people uh today i'm not sure on the panel how many trans queer people we have on the table but let's not forget that representation does matter and how are we calling ourselves intersectional if we don't have intersectional people on the panel and with that note i'll end uh, i keep note and thank you for this yes thank you so much radhika ma'am for presenting your perspective um yes of course um, the point that you highlight is that we need to present tailored solutions that cater to different needs of the communities that are present because not every community is on the same level in regards to menstrual awareness and um, also like the infrastructure facilities and everything yes so thank you so much for presenting your views um uh, now that we are done with the keynote uh, address of all the guest speakers let us quickly move to 
the discussions round. So my fo so first of all, I would um, like to ask um, Drishti ma'am, Drishti Patni ma'am. Uh, so uh, I would like to yes. um, uh, ask you about um, the Girl Up initiative. So Girl Up has been a part of um, the Indian community for a long time. And there are many Girl Up initiatives that have been taken from time to time. Even we have Girl Up Bani as one of our collaborators. So um, I just wanted to ask you about, um, do you think that um, there's a significant change since the time you've started in the way that the menstrual issues are viewed and the role of initiatives like Girl Up in relation to that? Uh, thank you so much for the question. I'm, I'm seriously sorry about the disturbance in the back. I'm sharing the room with someone right now. But um, um, Girl Up has been uh, there since 2010, all across the world, creating impact. And um, Girl Up uh, India has been there since around 2014. Um, and I, I, I kind of, ha I ha call me biased, but I'm like literally hands down to the entire Girl Up initiative because they have been doing a wonderful work, um, not just in the area of menstrual hygiene and menstrual awareness, but when it comes to women in STEM, women in sports, women in leadership roles, um, create, um, and, and not just women, creating intersectional um communities and bringing the topic of intersectionality on the table and creating um, awareness about the queer communities as well um I, I really appreciate the work that all the girl up communities are doing and not just saying it because i lead a girl up community but i've been associated with so many girl up clubs in the past 2 to 2.5 years that i see the groundwork that they're doing in small cities or small towns that they are nothing nothing huge but I, I always feel like if you can impact one person, that in itself is a huge impact that you're creating. You do not need to find like 10 people to impact. Even one person whose life you can tr completely transform is a huge impact for me. Um, speaking speaking about Girl Up coverage, uh, so when I started like 1.7 years ago, um, I, I did not have like such a huge goal in mind that I want to impact 500 women or 1,000 women or 700 women. Of course, of course, that's a huge number for me because I have a, I have a team that is spread across India. And we are working across India, but the major focus is always on the Delhi NCR region because uh, the huge chunk of the team is concentrated in the Delhi NCR region. And um, when we started and we when we first did our first menstrual hygiene awareness camp, we went to this slum area and uh, we sat and we talked to women there and they were so reluctant to talk to us. That, I mean, they I kind of feel that they shamed us away or they wanted us to just go away because they were not comfortable uh, talking about uh, menstrual hygiene awareness as a whole and um, um, so cut down to last month we went back to the slum and they were so welcoming and they, they were ready to discuss their problems and they were ready um, to talk about what's happening or they're ready to um, talk about the challenges that they were facing so for me um, creating awareness with coverage is not just going somewhere for one time and just donating the pads and teaching them how to use it and just done full stop it's about keep reaching out to that community keep understanding where um uh, where their problems lie or where where they are facing difficulties and then together um synergize to see where you can help them or where you can um eradicate those problems for them and of course i mean uh, not just girl up there's so many initiatives across india um the pinkish foundation is there painted red is there there's so many initiatives that they're doing a great great work so it's not just that you need to focus on girl up uh, as an international ngo or an international club even the even if one person goes out and helps another person i think that's a huge impact in itself That was a very insightful answer. Uh, the thing that you mentioned that we should be practicing this on a ground level to bring up a change. I think this is the thought that we all should be carrying out in our brains. Only then we can change uh, the environment and make it a positive, you know, period positive environment for everyone. And only then we can just uh, remove the stigma that is prevalent in the society too. Thank you so much, Pam. Now, uh, I would like to discuss uh, this with Drishti Makijini, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, as you mentioned that, uh, you know, the period uh, product should be more accessible and uh, we should um, just uh, go with more vending machines which are accessible uh, to the washrooms and just not a particular uh, space or, you know, in a particular uh, room like the informally that you have mentioned. Uh, 
So, uh, do you believe that the government needs to take up more quantitative steps towards uh, promoting menstrual education in India? Like, what would be the good starting point for that? Um, again, I think I'd be reiterating what I said in my beginning remarks that, um, you know, accessibility of pads is yes one thing, and again, just like a quick thing that. A vending machine doesn't really have to be a very, um, you know, a be like a very expensive sort of a machine or any of that. Maybe a starting point is a tray or a you know a basket could be a great starting point for nice like a, for for clean pads to be stacked for them to be made accessible. That's what I mean by uh, vending machines, particularly not the highly sensitive ones where you scan and pay and stuff like that happens, but just like accessibility. Um, when I say, uh, what can what can be the good starting point in terms of policy? If we start to also include um, awareness and menstrual and sex ed as a part of education, where there is more. Um, conversation that is happening there's more awareness so i think i would circle back again to the entire awareness um like pointer as i had mentioned in my opening remarks yes thank you so much drishti ma'am for presenting your views um so i think yes um, it is really important to just have a starting point uh moving to uh moving to our next panelist uh Naharika ma'am uh, i would like to ask you since you mentioned um, in your keynote address as well um your work with the vulnerable communities um the rural uh, the people in the rural areas and like people from lower income backgrounds so um could you just give us insights into your personal understanding of period poverty and how uh, girls in poverty stricken areas are affected um, and their academic career is affected because of periods right um so so number one i'd like to say something about how we view um, menstruation as just like a, and this is something like radhika and i both spoke about um and uh, this this is also something that comes up Uh, within the queer community quite a bit that what ends up happening is that when we view it just as a um women's issue or like a girls issue um we leave behind people who are also menstruators and this this is um exacerbated in rural india and in rural parts across the world that is what ends up happening um so it just helps in general to view it as like a um thing that bodies do and it can be any body right um so the even the research that we've done into um the dropout rates and the kind of um impact that it has of course um we see that uh, it is girls that are dropping out but then there is also data that we aren't collecting about other menstruators um and as a queer person myself i feel um it is sort of a disservice to um the way that um you know communities are structured and the way that data is available about communities um so when talking about like your question uh, specifically the way periods impact education is a very causal link um if somebody is not able to take care of themselves the data suggests that um they leave school for about 20% of their um uh, time and uh, that should really not be the case um schools should be making um infrastructural and um you know um health resources such as um if that is even like pads right um if that is the easiest intervention that is possible though i really appreciate that radhika highlighted um that that is the way that you know we've been focusing and that is not like the only solution that solves the problem um 
but if say each community if we had data available um, about how people uh, prefer to manage their periods we might be able to uh, respond better to the needs of students in schools um if it is um clean cloths you know that they need or if it is pads that they need if those are made available we would not see this amount of um uh dropouts we would not see um what we are seeing today though that does not solve the problem entirely um menstrual health is one layer of um multiple issues that can persist in a personal you know person's life um and what does tend to happen and something that i've seen um within data that we have also collected at uh, pir is that if somebody is unable to manage their menstrual health they are likely to also have socio economic challenges that also um kind of are being hurdles to them being able to attend school so somebody might have financial issues that are also adding to them not being able to attend school if that makes sense um so it is not just menstrual health that exists it becomes like a systemic problem at the end of the day um so solving for a fundamental right that is mhm um is one way to go but obviously there are other policies and other interventions that can solve for uh, things that are also continuing to have great impact um on a person's life i hope that answers your question thank you radhika nami harika sharma ma'am uh, that was indeed a very dynamic perspective and uh, the work that you have already taken the initiatives that you have taken and the work that you have done in this field is remarkable and the perspective that you laid right now on the government policies uh that should be implemented uh you know to promote the uh, menstrual education in schools uh that was indeed a, a very thought provoking um uh, words so to end the discussion i would like to ask my last question to radhika modi mom uh, uh, do you think that gender and sexuality should be tackled along with menstrual education in schools yeah of course for sure i mean uh, if a person feels uncomfortable in their own bodies and like we have already discussed of menstrual health menstruation itself is a bodily process how are they supposed to feel comfortable with menstruation also and uh, the thing is these conversations are happening in isolation uh, conversations around menstruation conversations around sexuality if they are happening at all they're happening in isolation in happening in silo and that's not holistic in the longer run and uh, as someone who runs a queer collective in a muslim university uh, i first had noticed that people feeling uh, really isolated because they have not had those conversations and they are constantly looking out for safer spaces uh, uh, like drishti mentioned that schools are you know like the first places people go it's like a foundation right and a lot of people look out uh, beyond their families in schools for families you know uh, people who are not connected by blood people look out for friends they can confide to the teachers they can confide to counselors they can confide to if they have a counselor in the first place and these conversations can really shape up uh, our perspective towards a lot of things that uh, like we are talking about this intersectionality right and uh, even like class issue caste issues uh, come uh, hand in hand for me but i know these are very very nuanced conversations to have and we cannot expect the government to do it um, you know all together and that's why uh, like some of you mentioned we will we'll need a collaborative process um, of different ngos different bodies coming together and having these conversations yeah um thank you so much for for your insights ma'am um so uh, before we proceed further uh, we would be inviting uh, some of our uh, some of the people who had participated in our article writing competition that was organized so before we proceed to that round uh, i would quickly like to take a feedback from you that how you felt about the session check your emotions so on
I can um, so can we have Rishti Makhijani first? I think I'm very, very grateful to have attended this session. Uh, it was extremely insightful. It was a great learning experience for me as well. Um, so yeah, I think I would like to thank Sarkari School, We the Citizens Foundation, um, Gala Bani, and everyone else involved in organizing this conference. Um, so thank you so much for having me here. And it was really, really great interacting and learning from everybody. Thank you so much. Um, Drishti Bhatti, ma'am. Uh, uh, just following up to what Drishti said, um, uh, it has been a great learning experience for me as well because I always feel like the more people you hear to, uh, you're talking about a particular issue, the more you yourself grow and your more the pro your perspective grows. And of course, thanks to all the organizers for having me here. Um, it was it was lovely um, to hear everyone. And thank you, thank you so much for having me here. Just just gratitude to everyone. Uh, Radhika ma'am, could you please go next? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, like everyone else said, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, I think it's a good start uh, with this conversation. I think it's a very, very long way ahead. But always happy to talk about this. So again, thanks for having me. And Radhika ma'am, you? Yeah, I feel like I resonate with uh, everything that everyone has said. Um, and uh, it's been great to be here um, and to take uh, the conversation to more people, perhaps who were maybe um, wanting to learn more, um, get involved. And um, yeah, I think I think this was great. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. Um, now we would invite uh, we would invite participants of the article writing competition to present their articles one by one. You would get two to three minutes of time, and as we are running short on time, I'd request that you strictly adhere to the time limit. Um, so first, I would invite Purva. Please, Purva, the stage is yours. Uh, Ria, I will be presenting the paper on behalf of our team. Okay, yes. Uh, may I start presenting? Uh, yes, you can. Please go ahead, Ajinkya. Uh, I hope my screen is visible to all. Yes, it's visible. Uh, greetings, everyone. Today, I will be presenting the research done by me and my research partner, Purva Nagrade, on the topic of an insight on the aspects influencing the use of hygienic protection during menstruation. Our research was conducted in the following manner. A literature review of the existing research on menstrual hygiene, education, and awareness the data used was collected from the National Family Health Survey held in 2019 to 2021. We did a comparative correlation test to identify the most significant relationships between the 25 key indicators and the factor of utilization of hygienic protection during menstruation. There were several significant factors that influenced the use of hygienic protection out of those, we had women's literacy, years of education, the internet use, and the age of marriage that were shown to be the most significant indicators for the use of hygienic protection. Women with C rates and those with a higher years of schooling were shown a more positive correlation with the chance of using hygienic products. On the other hand, early marriage and adolescent pregnancy were negatively correlated with the chances of using hygienic products. In the following diagrams, we can see that women with 10 or more years of schooling had a higher chance of using hygienic protection. We can see that the data points are very uh, concentrated during on the regression line. We can also see that women who have ever used the internet show the second most significant relationship and women 
with the literacy rate, higher literacy rates show the third most significant. On the other hand, women who were married before 18 years of age shows the most negative correlation with use of hygienic products. And this also, this also shows that social awareness and harmful tradition can contribute very significantly to the use of hygienic products during menstruation. Uh, I will conclude my presentation with the highlights of our research. Our study highlights the importance of menstrual hygiene, education, and awareness. As we have seen that literacy and education are the most significant factors that lead to women using hygienic products and promote menstrual hygiene management. Availability of menstrual products implementing proper waste systems are crucial steps in promoting menstrual hygiene. School policies and social awareness play the most significant role in the supportive environment that we create for menstruating students. By addressing these key factors and promoting menstrual hygiene, we believe that we can empower women and ensure their well-being. I thank you all for patiently listening to me. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Ajinkya. Um, next, I would like to invite Akanksha Gupta to present her paper. Hello, everyone. I am Akanksha Gupta, a postgraduate student of public administration, Indra Gandhi National Open University. First, a very heartfelt thank to Sakari School Dotin and team to shortlist my article as top 15 article to publish. First of all, I would like to uh, give you a brief about my article. My theme of the article was policy impact and collaboration in menstrual health. Like as you have discussed about that, how important it is to have a menstrual policy. And menstruation is now being recognized globally. Global actions are being taken. The recent developments that we can see, the global menstruation hygiene day and the menstrual leaves are being adopted and implemented like nations like Soviet Union, Japan and Spain have already worked on it. And in Indian context, I would like to, you know, uh, give a brief about the article published as per the Times of India that around above 70 percent of the women can't afford to the menstruation sanitary product. And there is an inadequacy of clean water facilities. The period friendly institutions are uh, nowhere present and the lack of menstrual hygiene, which is ultimately increasing the uh, risk of urinary tract infections and poor reproductive health. In school, they have to relook really deeper into the cases of dropouts among the young girl students, which is undermining their two important rights, their fundamental rights, that is right to education under Article 21A and the right to health under Article 21. For this, we need to collaborate in a large space, like various stakeholders like NGOs, civil societies, and uh, academicians and policymakers, certain professionals, entrepreneurs have to collaborate and unite force behind the issues. And there is a need of a long-term sustainable impact in terms of accessibility, use, and proper disposal. At last, many initiatives won the applause, but it's now the time to move from a period poverty world to menstrually positive world and need to reshape the vision, mission, and strategy in menstrual health to endorse every aspect of women's life, that be it biological, educational, cultural, and the confidence building in women's life. Government definitely are the core bearers of strategic development in menstrual health. They have to consider a policy of decentralized procurement, distribution, and proper disposal with a robust infrastructure management of schools, offices. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Akanksha, for wonderfully presenting your paper for us and summarizing um, all the broader topics in such a nice way that everybody can well um, well relate to that. Um, so let us call Amir Agarwal next to present his paper. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. You're perfectly audible. Please go ahead. Uh, please kindly let me know when my screen is visible. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible now? Uh, 
um, no, it's not. But I think you can um, go ahead as it is without sharing your screen. Uh, actually, I wanted to show a, a couple of things. Can you check? Okay. Uh, okay. If you can add my screen from yours. Um, no, I'm not able to see it yet. Yes, now it's visible. It's visible. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having me. So my talk. Uh, I'm Amay Agrawal from I am Kodi Code. My topic was around the taboo that is related to menstrual education also and uh, menstruation. So I chose uh, this because be because of the lack of education, I think this is the darkness that is causing these taboos. And because of taboos, we are not able to get into much of the research or much of the steps that can be taken. And this is actually making the issues grave. Uh, so in this uh, paper or article which I have written, I have talked about the natural uh, reasons why there is a stigma around menstruation, how lack of education is impacting girls. Uh, some research has been included in this. For example, 70% of the girls in a study in Mumbai don't understand menstruation before experiencing their first period. And also the importance of promoting knowledge and uh, awareness about menstruation. So uh, first of all, I uh, really enjoyed that I, there was another uh, male candidate while presenting the paper because I believe that gender divide is one of uh, a very great reason that we are not able to scale up our impact as fast as we can because we are losing almost on the 50 percent of the world population that are men uh, that can actually contribute to this particular cause because in most parts still men are the uh, involved in the decision making of the allocation of the household resources uh, they can help in the social domain household work community work social uh, school work and if they are not involved uh, we don't have their support as well so it is very important to involve men in all these processes uh, the next is role of educational institution uh, the change starts because of education and if educational institutions are not involved i think uh, the change cannot happen because educational institutes are pivotal in advocating for this good menstrual hygiene management uh, apart from that uh, they also need to have some kind of educational structure or as well as some curriculum that makes the education formal about the menstrual practices because it has a lasting impact not only on the female child but also on the family because also the research has shown which i have included in the article that a proper education actually increases the attendance of uh, female participants in the school also it has some far reaching benefits so there are these are some of the benefits uh, apart from the knowledge attitude and practice among girls uh, the benefits of this menstrual education is also resulting in the increased understanding increased uh, self perception and better academic performance among the girls hence it is very necessary to impact them about the menstrual cycles uh, then there are three kinds of uh, knowledge gaps that i have understood first was understanding the habits and uh, the environment in the high schools because uh, not everyone is aware so not proper practices are been taken also there are some kind of educational measures for example what kind of curriculum or what kind of education we can give uh, to schools uh, uh, through girls uh, as well as the through the family members and also about the proper information of the hygiene practices as well as the associated health risk so the plan uh, that can be implemented in the schools could include uh, about information about the menstrual cycle hygiene practices discomfort management uh, body image cultural perspectives uh, gender equality and emotional well-being because this has resulted as studies have shown in a better self esteem academic uh, success as well as the respect for diversity also ensuring accessibility and affordability is a key aspect because without accessibility and affordability no change can happen and as many of the participants has already shared with us that clean water sanitation and menstrual products are necessary to have uh, and also creating inclusive environment because uh, i think not many men are comfortable still talking about menstruation so this is the beginning which we can see in our own homes so unless uh, people are not comfortable openly discussing about these challenges or the taboos which we feel taboo are not actually taboos but unless they feel comfortable about talking this i think a change cannot happen so we need to normalize this conversation and also have this uh, confidence among the girls that they can take up these issues 
uh, some campaigns and initiatives which we can take is like the uh, pad projects or providing pads in the schools so uh, girls don't miss the schools also in local communities we can take up pad manufacturing by women that can help us in employment uh, for the women as well as the pad availability so the final conclusion is uh, prioritizing menstrual education in the formal sense i feel is a very important where both not only the girls but boys are also involved uh, also having open communication that will break the chains of stigma uh, will actually help in empowering the girls and joining forces for a better future because un unless we accept that this is a very natural process and there is nothing to be shy away from i think the change cannot happen so that is all from my side thank you so much um thank you so much ame for um, coming up with your wonderful research and also presenting it to everybody so uh, one of our guest ms khushboo sharma uh, was not able to join the conference due to some issues so she has dropped us a video message so i would like to share that but um, alongside i'd like to request urmi to just introduce her before we share her with you khushboo sharma ma is an experienced women's health menstrual and mental health advocate with a demonstrated history of working in the research industry skilled in management patient advocacy public speaking and project planning strong professional with a post graduate diploma in guidance and counseling focused on psychology from jamia millia islamia yes thank you ulmi Good morning, everyone. My name is Kushpu, and I would like to thank the team of Sarkari School and We Citizens to invite me as a panelist for this very enriching conference going on on shaping menstrual policies in schools. So my topic is around that only. I'll be talking about laying the foundation of menstrual policies in schools. As someone working in the area of women's health, I have been working for women's health and. Uh, removing social stigmas from the society menstrual uh, policies are important for menstrual policies are important for the well-being health and dignity of women and it not only helps in the you know management and wellness of managing some diseases but also some life complicated diseases and chronic diseases and it is very important to create awareness and have some policies around that when girls are forced to be on every girl has a right to manage her menstruation safely and with dignity and especially when young girls are forced to stay at home when they are not having the access to menstrual products and sanitation facilities uh, there comes a need of menstrual health policies many young girls face these issues while they are uh, having their menstrual days that they are not able to go to the school uh, due to lack of sanitation and access to healthcare products so it is very important that uh, they are uh, given the equal opportunity and they are not falling behind anyone because of these issues and the equal participation of the young girls in the society cannot be overstated so it has to be there and whenever we talk about menstrual health there also comes an issue of normalization of periods pain in the society that i have been uh, experiencing and you know while i was having menarche i was having extreme periods uh, heavy bleeding and i was not able to convey this to anyone and there was a lot of stigma that i have personally faced and i feel uh, the policies and awareness could be a game changer and could be a bigger step for creating and making the life of girls young girls better schools play a very critical role in building 
the blocks and part- creating participation of every child not only girls but every child and it has to be uh, something that only not only ensures the adequate uh, sanitation facilities importance of that and menstrual health policies awareness is equally important to be reached out to every stakeholder involved not only girls uh, it has to be reached out to every school and everyone should be aware of it despite of their gender to create gender equality schools play a, play a very critical role in promoting menstrual health and hygiene among girls and menstruation is a natural process and that affects like half of the population of the world but there is still very lack of awareness and that's where we are talking about it schools only not only help to break the stigmas but also help people to understand to behave in a particular way and to express themselves and tell them what has to be done what has not to be done and what is okay what is not okay and when it is the right time to approach to someone who knows about it it is very important when we are talking about menstrual health policies and how they are helping shape uh, the schools help break down the knowledge barriers by providing appropriate information comprehensive menstrual education and education that covers menstrual health information menstrual health information about the cycle what are the hygiene practices and sanitation product available this can help in girls this not only helps to understand the menstrual cycle but also to take up the best practices involved how we can choose the options which is also environment friendly for our own selves which can ultimately reduce the uh which can, which can ultimately reduce the risk of health complications as well by providing access to menstrual health education menstrual health policies introducing menstrual health policies in the school access to san- uh, sanitary safe sanitary pads for schools and creating a supportive environment we all can contribute ourselves contribute our efforts to make this uh, an initiative and awareness and reduce the stigmas around it Um thank you so much Kushbu ma'am we really appreciate your efforts to be a part of this conference and sending in a video message for us um now i would like to uh, announce that the session is concluding and we have another ongoing session on beyond the taboos education and awareness on menstruation so i highly suggest that all of the audience uh start watching that session that is live on youtube right now and now with that i would like to invite aryan choudhury to present a formal vote of thanks and conclude the session thank you riya i am delighted to express my gratitude and appreciation towards all the esteemed guests and dignitaries who have graced this conference with their wisdom and ideas thank you so much for joining us it was truly a thought provoking discussion and it would have not been possible without you our esteemed panelists My heartfelt thanks to the organizing team and Sarkari School for their hard work towards making this discussion a successful one. And to summarize all these esteemed guest panelists have talked about, it was basically that we have to normalize menstruation, and it's a natural thing, and it's out of the control of women, and we have to normalize it, and we have to have normal conversations about it. It's a natural process, uh, and it's nothing abnormal. and the government as well as the entire community have to work on spreading awareness about menstruation so that the students can understand that menstruation is nothing to be ashamed about it's a normal bodily process and so that the male students or the men of the society can help the women in now going through the painful process and to understand their problems and to provide as much support as possible and also to support the female students in school because at a very early age uh, you know getting ashamed about uh, menstruation or thinking that it's something which is unspeakable or un- something like that it may affect them uh, mentally a lot and it may affect their education as well so it's our responsibility to you know take all genders into consideration and teach them about menstruation and spread awareness about the same so last but not the least i would like to thank you all our audience and listeners for actively being part of the conference and being with us the whole time we really appreciate your participation 
Once again, thank you to everyone who has contributed towards making this event a grand success. Thank you so much, Arjun. Thank you so much, Arjun. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arjun.